Welcome back to Sunday Sessions with Abba Tum. Um, I'm back this week with another video and this one is called The Truth About African Spirituality and this one's slightly different because we're actually going off the back of another video that I that actually came up on my YouTube um, feed and I'm kind of used to seeing these videos going around everybody's got something to say about African spirituality and she did this series um, I believe it's a seven part series on you know like the truth about African spirituality and witchcraft and all these different practices but this is the specific video that I wanted to kind of respond to so if you've watched her video then I would encourage you to watch this one and kind of weigh up both arguments and come to a logical decision because again as you look at the, the evidence that I'm going to present today including what we've already covered in regards to you know the, the origins of Judaism and Christianity together a lot of her arguments already don't hold any weight but we're going to go through it bit by bit and you know as with anything else this isn't a personal attack on anyone not even Stephanie um, this isn't a personal attack on anybody who currently has you know Christian beliefs or Judaistic beliefs this is just um, an offering that I'm presenting and that I'm hoping will challenge some of your thinking and just cause you to look a bit deeper into what you've aligned yourself with. So, as I said, we previously covered in the videos prior to this one, the origins of Judaism and Christianity. And, you know, it's quite clear that a lot of what has been presented as, you know, the Abrahamic faiths or religions are simply renditions of, you know, spirituality that have been stolen from the African continent. So. For me personally, um, another thing I wanted to say was that my personal journey, you know, out of Christianity was not an overnight process. I didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. And then, you know, just have everything under the sun to say again, faith. I started my research, I would say in about 2020, around the time of um, COVID, because the fact that we were all locked down, I didn't have anything else to do except read. Um, I've always considered myself an avid reader even before that. A lot of the books that I'm going to be presenting to you today I've had in my library from even when I was a Christian. And so um, as I was going deeper and deeper into my, my research, there were things that became apparent to me that couldn't just be um, kind of washed away with just faith speech. That there were, there were clear cut questions that had to be asked. And as I dug deeper, the faith that I held so dear to my heart began to unravel. And one thing I will say to you is, if you're watching this video, um, you have to come to a place where you're so confident and so conscious of who you are inherently as yourself that you don't have any you know, care or concern for what people think of you if you decide to leave anything that you're involved in. At the end of the day, life is a process, it's a journey. And so you can subscribe to something one day and then maybe you come into more truth or you come into more understanding and there's nothing wrong with pivoting. And I think there's, there's like a, a really massive stigma you know, especially in, you know, questions of spirituality where, you know, somebody moves from a certain faith to another or somebody loses their so-called faith completely in Christianity. They're called so many, they're called all sorts of names under the sun, you know, backslider, blasphemer. Um, you know, they get labeled with all of these things like, oh, this person's gone crazy or oh, this person's done this. But nobody actually sits down to, you know, really ponder and question why people actually leave. It really took I would say about three years to, you know, work through this whole process and undo the mental conditioning that we're all under to see the world a certain way. And as we, as I said, as we go through the video, we're going to unpack this and you'll truly understand. One of the narratives that I truly want to destroy and truly want to break is that any of these Abrahamic faiths have brought, you know, liberation or salvation to any of us as a people, because that is a fallacy. And you can tell by the condition of you know, majority of black and indigenous people across the, um, across the world, you know, various cultures, you know, the state of our nations, that that can never and has never been the case. Rather, their traditional spiritual systems have been demonized in order to destroy them. So in the last video, I made a statement talking about how, you know, all of the things that we've covered so far really culminate to white supremacy. And again, we've touched on it in dibs and dabs, but I'm gonna go into it in a bit further detail here. Okay, that's better. <laughs> I think I was too close to the camera. But yeah, we're gonna go into a bit more detail here. So I'm gonna open this up with a quote. And the quote says, if you do not understand white supremacy, racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand or think you understand will only confuse you. 
And this was a statement made by Neely Fuller Jr. in 1971. Now again, people might be confused, um, especially if you haven't watched the previous videos. Like I honestly implore you to watch the previous video. The question that most people would ask is what does white supremacy have to do with African spirituality? Let's just, you know, read a quick definition of what white supremacy actually is. And the book that I'm referring to is called The ISIS Papers. And it was written by um, a psychologist um, called Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Um, to explain essentially the phenomena of what you know racism is and what white supremacy is so it says that her current functional definition of racism or white supremacy is as follows the local and global power system structured and maintained by persons who classify themselves as white whether consciously or subconsciously determined this system consists of patterns of percep perception logic symbol formation thought speech action and emotional response as conducted simultaneously in all areas of people activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. The ultimate purpose of the system is to prevent white genetic annihilation on earth, a planet in which the overwhelming majority of people are classified as non-white, black, brown, red, and yellow by white skinned people. All of the non-white people are genetically dominant in terms of skin coloration, compared to the genetically recessive white-skinned people. Um, there's so much that we could talk about. There's a, there's a full scope. I feel like I could do a whole video on, you know, white supremacy and the, the legacy that it's left behind. And going off the back of the video that we did previously, I want you guys to begin to piece together the understanding that one's spiritual system is always central to the culture. It's the way of life for the entire nation. From the beginning of time, the spiritual system was always the way of life for the entire nation. It's not separate from law, politics, science, philosophy, or even sexual behavior. And as I said, you know, before in ancient times, you know, spiritual systems were holistic. As we go a bit deeper into the video, we'll go into that in depth, but spiritual systems encompass everything from your ecology, your environment, your healthcare systems, you know, your spiritual system encompass everything. When the Western nations or, you know, Western cultures went into Egypt and raided you know, um, ancient Kemet and destroyed all of their, you know, their founding, their founding principles and destroyed their peoples. They took what they wanted for themselves and they changed it and edited it in a way that would bring them into a position of superiority over everyone else in the world who was black and indigenous. Because as we said in the beginning, the majority of the world are black, red and yellow, as said by the whites, and they're actually in the minority. So how is it possible that they lord it over everyone else and yet black and indigenous people are always at the bottom? That's not an accident, that is intentional and there is a process, there is thousands of years in process for them to actually get you know, our reality to this point. All Western nations from the beginning of time have developed this system of white supremacy. Hence, you can go to every Western nation and see the same dynamics being played out in every level of society, from actions to intentions. And Western nations are the only nations till this day that have nuclear weapons. And the USA is the only country to have actually used them not once, but twice. And again, this gives you like an indication to the type of people that we're dealing with. It gives you an indication to the psyche. Because like I said, with African spiritual systems or African sacred science, there's such a reverence for nature. But you have to consider the fact that, you know, Europeans have you know, not only sat down and created drugs and inoculations and all sorts of, you know, pharmaceutical, you know, so-called medicines to maim and destroy black people, but they've also sat down and created weapons that are able to wipe out whole civilizations over thousands of kilometers of landmass in one time. No other culture has ever done that in the history up until this day. The mistake that most people make is to reduce racism or white supremacy to a few individuals, but completely overlook the system that has been erected, that permeates, permeates our actual reality so the main reason that i you know created the videos on christianity and you know just generally the abrahamic religion is to prove without question of a doubt they are based in a false history and with a combination of theft of african spirituality gods and principles so this video that i said i was referencing as i said it was created by a lady called stephanie ikafor and 
this video that she's put together is essentially demonizing African spirituality and talking about how people, you know, in this wake of, you know, information, people are going back to essentially their cultures and, you know, wanting to worship the gods of their ancestors or how she put it, the gods of their ancestors. And, you know, she's covered this video on Christianity and, you know, covered, you know, a, a bit of African spirituality of her experiences of African spirituality and then sought to demonize the whole of African spirituality and champion the God of the Bible. Now, from we, what we've already covered, you kind of already see where I'm going with this, but I really wanted to go into this in absolute depth so you can see for yourself how you know as a people in the 21st century we have been conditioned to demonize one thing over another without looking at the actual evidence of it because in this entire video she makes references and you know she boots Kirk Franklin which again I'll play you know part of it the video where he speaks as well and they're making references to all these claims but she does not back up not even one of her claims with any references outside of the bible and this is something that you know christians have been you know again conditioned to do that if a preacher stands up and speaks they'll make references to the bible and then say all a whole load of fancy things without providing any historical references without providing any proof and because it sounds good you just accept it and believe it so anyway i'm just going to play this video you know in the corner and i want you guys to see what she says with regards to this idea or this notion that you know christianity is a white man's religion bearing in mind what we've already covered i want you to see what she says so it starts by saying now an angel of the lord said to philip rise and go toward the south of the road that goes down from jerusalem to gaza this is a desert place and he rose and went and there was an ethiopian a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. So first of all, you have, you know, an angel encounters Philip and he is sent to meet this Ethiopian eunuch. This Ethiopian eunuch is not just any regular eunuch. He had the trust of the queen. He was in charge of all her treasure. You know that saying about, you know, where your where your heart is, that is where your act in fact, I don't even know the saying right now. <laughs> Let me customize it. It has to do something about where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. Actually, that's the saying, right? So this woman entrusted all her treasure to this Ethiopian eunuch. That tells you that she had trust in this man. So this Ethiopian eunuch, not, he, he not only represented his family, or I mean, well, he was a eunuch, so that goes out the door actually, but he not only represented himself, he actually represented the influence connected to him. This man had the ability to influence, it's safe to assume that he had the ability to influence the queen, to share with the queen what he has known as a conviction for himself. Why I keep saying this is for you to pay attention to the supernatural investment in getting Philip to, to um, share the message of the gospel with this Ethiopian eunuch. And so then when we look at history, we realize that one of the oldest churches centuries before any, any type of slavery was taking place in Africa, Centuries before that, one of the oldest churches is located in Ethiopia. Could it be that there was such a connection with what that Ethiopian eunuch came to know about Jesus that he was able to sow seeds of his faith that brought the message of the gospel to Ethiopia? If we look at the dating system and we look at history, we've already discussed the fact that you know, the date, the calendar that we use today was created by the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire encompassed so much of the, you know, the Western and the, the, the Northern part of Africa. Now, one thing that I want to point out and make clear again to those that didn't watch the previous video, the area that we call Ethiopia today, Ethiopia wouldn't have even existed. So where did that Ethiopian unit come from? And we also spoke about the fact that, you know, when you look at ancient maps and, you know, the furthest that I've been able to find is probably like 1700s. Even at that time in the 16 to 1700s, Ethiopia was central Africa and most of the region of Africa was referred to as Ethiopia. Hence, you know, the Atlantic Ocean that we know it today was called the Ethiopian Ocean because of the fact that it encompassed the continent of Africa. If you were called an Ethiopian, it just meant you were dark skin and black. When you look 
look at you know the the biblical accounts it doesn't add up you know time wise even though they created the calendar system that we use they created you know the timeline of bc and ad based on this false character it still doesn't add up she references history but she doesn't give you any historical points again you can find the, li the link in the description but when we talk about you know the conversion of ethiopia it makes it very plain that ethiopia that we know it today one time was called axum a-x-u-m so the world history encyclopedia says the african kingdom of axum was located on the northern edge of the highland zone of the red sea coast just above the horn of africa it was founded in the first century ce flourished from the third to the sixth century and then survived as a smaller political entity into the eighth century the territory axum once controlled is today occupied by the states of ethiopia Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, and Somaliland. That's a much bigger, you know, landmass than what we're calling Ethiopia today. On documented record, it talks about the fact that a Catholic monk called Frumentius was the first missionary to attend this area that we call Ethiopia today. And he converted the king, which rendered the kingdom a Christian kingdom and then became a part of the Roman Empire. And the reason we know this is because Axum, or Ethiopia as we know it today, was also the first African nation to mint its own coins. So this idea of, you know, Ethiopia as we know it today, being you know the, the the home or the birthplace of christianity on the african continent is complete hogwash and even when we refer to you know the ethiopian bible it's also documented that the ethiopian bible has one copy which was which was also referred to as the grima gospel the catholic monk who wrote the bible for the ethiopians he wrote it in 494 a.d so this is hundreds of years after this, you know, this account of the Ethiopian eunuch being witnessed to or evangelized to by Philip. The scripts have been dated 330 to 650 AD. So this is roughly 500 years, if we're talking about median numbers, 500 years after this so-called, you know, account in the Bible of the Ethiopian eunuch meeting Philip on the road. And it's documented in history that Ethiopia didn't become a Christian nation until they were converted by Frumentius, who was a Catholic, and were given a set of scriptures by another Catholic monk called Garima. And this is also keeping in mind that at the time that these events even happened, Ethiopia as a country didn't even exist. So I'm just gonna play another part of her video and then we'll continue. As we think about this, and we hear this whole conversation about, I can serve the God of my ancestors and all of that. The reality is, even without you know, colonialism, slavery, and all of this, Africans would have brought the gospel to Africans. If, if we had enough time, we would have shared the gospel with one another. So she mentioned that, you know, if we had enough time, so between the, you know, the biblical accounts, which we'll consider first century, which is like 1 AD to 100 AD, that if we had enough time, and you know, slavery and colonization didn't happen, which again, historical record documents slavery from starting in the year 1619. Are you meaning to tell me that in 1,600 years, Christianity was the truth, Jesus Christ is real, and you know, the Holy Spirit was able to transport Philip to a completely different place in the twinkle of an eye and witness to an Ethiopian eunuch who apparently took the gospel back to his hometown of Ethiopia, that in 1,600 years before slavery occurred, that we wouldn't have been able to transport the gospel amongst ourselves? Even without phone, internet, ever, 1,600 years is more than enough time to spread the gospel, especially if we're going on, you know, based on the fact that the Holy Spirit was able to transport Philip to speak to an Ethiopian eunuch, couldn't the Holy Spirit have done that, you know, thousands of times to get the, the gospel to various places on the continent if this was the truth? It's, it's not quite adding up. But anyway, let me play this next video because she, you know, she, she plays this part where she gets Kirk Franklin to come and speak about his understanding of how the Bible is essentially fermented in Africa. We're talking about this, you know, this flawed idea that Christianity was a, is a white man's religion. And I actually want to share with you just a few minutes from our conversation because just because of the value it adds and the perspective that Kirk brings. And so I want you to check this out and we'll be right back. In the no northern sub-Saharan parts of Africa, there were men and women mm -hmm. that were following the faith that now we call Christianity. Yeah. And, and, and even in the ancient city of Alexandria, which is the most educated part of the, Medi of, 
of the ancient world at that time, um, um, having the most expensive library at the time, um, the disciple Mark started his first church in Alexandria. <laughs> and so you look at all of the uh, uh, influence that Africa had yeah. on Europe. It came because they were practicing what is now considered Christian beliefs exactly. in the faith of Jesus Christ, exactly. and, you know, from Augustine, from from uh, from a Clement, and then even when you move even into Europe, you have non-Christian men and women that were influenced by Christianity. Uh, you have Josephus, you have Pliny the Younger, who were Jews. These um, these were Jews that even saw the influence of Christianity even at that time. Yeah. And so you have unbelieving men that write in their autobiographies the history of Jesus, and then you talk about uh, uh, even of legend, the earliest writings of Jesus Christ were in uh, AD 90. Christ died in, in uh, AD 30. So in 60 years, you still have eyewitness accounts of the, of the human, of the man of Jesus Christ doing miracles that, that was accounted by people that were still alive to see it. And so wow. the reason why that's so important because it leaves room for the lack of legend when you have people that have eyewitness accounts of these actual events. Because remember, the whole Jewish faith was a, was a verbal faith. That's true. J um, Judaism, um, 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 young men cannot even leave their home at the time unless they could uh, oracly speak the Torah. That's they had true. to memorize the Torah. They had to memorize and, it, yeah. And so, 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 so oracle belief in the ancient world was so important. And so um, they they prided themselves on being able to uh, give you back the history of, of a particular they, faith. Because they knew that by memory. Yes, yes. they knew that about their own mm -hmm. faith. And so before the transatlantic slave trade, before colonialism, Christianity existed. existed. Now, at the same time, we do have to acknowledge that, yes, there has been a whitewashing of Christianity That's in true. the West. That's it is true. very true, and we have to acknowledge that. That's true. There's been abuse of the Bible uh, to... to uh, oppressed uh, black and brown people uh, it was used all through slavery but again that is so i'm going to stop it there um and just basically just reference the fact that you know he in his speech he's basically talking about you know the writings that are accountable by people who were still alive to see it and we've already covered this in the previous video as being a fallacy because the writings of josephus can't be validated they're not concrete but the fact that we already know from the previous video that the calendar was created and that the characters were written in to the time frame to validate the story just cancels out everything that he said. But one thing that I wanted to point out, which is really important, is that he mentions, you know, disciple Mark essentially started a church in the area of Alexandria. So let me just, I just want you to know who Mark the Evangelist is and then refer, like read the information on the church that he's claiming was built by this apostle or this evangelist called Mark um, in order to validate, you know, this idea of Christianity being on the continent of Africa, you know, well before slavery. And I'll put these links again below. So this, um, this article, Described, Mark the Evangelist was known as John Mark or Saint Mark. He is the person who is traditionally ascribed to the author of the Gospel of Mark. Modern Bible scholars have concluded that the Gospel of Mark was written by an anonymous author rather than by Mark. So that already tells you something. According to church tradition, tradition, Mark founded the Ep Episcopal of Alexandria, which was one of the most important sees of early Christianity. His feast day is celebrated on 8, April 25th and his symbol is the winged lion. So let's click on the link, you know, with regards to this church that apparently he founded. St. Mark's Coptic Orthodox Cathedral is a Coptic church in Alexandria, Egypt. It is the historical seat of the Pope of Alexandria, the head of the Coptic Orthodox Church. And I'll put a picture of the church so you can see or the inside of the church so you can see it so it says the cathedral is said to stand on the site of the church founded by saint mark the evangelist in ad 42. in case you missed what i just said i'm going to say it slowly when kirk franklin was referencing this church he made it sound like it was fact from what we just read regarding mark the evangelist he's known as the disciple that wrote the book of mark but that even can't be verified and i'm not even going to go into all that because you've already covered that but he's he's referencing this church as being founded by mark as fact but it says the cathedral that stands there today the, the cathedral that you can go to egypt or you know alexandria to go and see today as we speak today is said to stand on the site of the church founded by saint mark the evangelist in ad 42 which means that it's not verified nobody can verify that mark the evangelist author 
of the second gospel has been connected with the city of Alexandria since the earliest Christian tradition. Tradition meaning it's not fact. Coptic Christians and Coptic just means like the earlier Christians because as we, we, talk, we spoke about in the previous video, the area of Egypt or what we consider the now Valley civilization was conquered by three various groups before you know all of these events were said to have taken place. They were conquered by the Greeks, they were conquered by the Romans, and they were also conquered by the Arabs. So Coptic Christians are basically the Christians or the quote unquote Christians that were living in Egypt or you know ancient Kemet at the time that the original people had already been removed and displaced. The Coptic Christians believe believe again not fact he arrived in Alexandria around AD 42 and stayed for about 72 42 years. According to tradition again not fact Saint Mark was arrested during a festival of Serapis in AD 68 and was martyred by being dragged through the streets and he was buried under the church that he founded. So in 1828 relics believed to be the body of saint mark was stolen from alexandria by venetian merchants and taken to venice cops believe that the head of saint mark remains in a church named after him in alexandria and parts of his relics are in saint mark's cairo's cathedral the rest of what are believed to his be his relics are in saint mark's basilica in venice italy the head of saint mark was moved around a great deal over the centuries and has been lost for over 250 years some of the relics from the body of St. Mark, however, were returned to Alexandria from Rome in 1968 during the papacy of Coptic Pope, Pope Cyril. The present St. Mark's Coptic Cathedral is of recent date, but is said to stand on the site of the church founded by St. Mark himself. So my question to you reading this is, based on all the evidence that I presented in the video before, none of this can be validated because there is currently a a new building which is said to have been the original place of the original church but how would anybody know because essentially it's not there anymore the church was said to be greatly ruined in 1641 when the arabs invaded egypt in 680 pope john iii rebuilt the church and in 18 to 8, 828 the body of saint mark was stolen by italian sailors and taken from alexandria to venice the church was destroyed again in 1219 the church was pulled down during the French invasion of Alexandria in July 1798 and then the church was rebuilt and opened in 1819. And so regardless of you know what people would like to believe that this church that stands there was founded by St. Mark, there is no verification whatsoever and there is no proof whatsoever. So again, we're listening to people, preachers, you know, um, gospel artists, you know, trying to grasp onto the fact that you know, this is not a white man's religion because, you know, it was founded in Africa. But all of their foundations have been proven to be false. Now, this is a book called The Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I've had this book for years. I think I've had this book for about 10 years. You know, this is another book that is, you know, kind of widely, you know, perpetrated to just prove the fact that, you know, from beginning of time, Christians were persecuted for their faith in the so-called Jesus Christ. So Palestine, about AD 363, it says there are no records left of the individuals martyred in Palestine. We know only in general the ways in which they gave their lives for Christ. Many were burned alive. Some were dragged by their feet through the streets naked until they died from loss of blood or pain and others were scolded to death or stoned and many had their brains beaten out with clubs. So this is supposed to be, you know, Palestine in AD 363. But as the book mentions, there are no records of this. Um, then it mentions Alexandria again, which is um, ancient Egypt, AD 363. In Alexandria, the Christians who were martyred were almost too many to count. They were killed by the sword, burned, crucified and stoned. Several had their stomach cut out and open um, and grain put inside. Pigs were then let loose on them to feed upon their grain and their intestines. So this is supposed to be um, AD 363. So if all of this persecution was going on in the so-called Christian church in its inception, then how was Mark able to build a, a church in exactly the same place where Christians were being killed for people to go and worship openly? Because the math isn't mathing. Um, Constantine the Great, who was the emperor of Rome between AD 306 and 337. Um, and the reason why I'm, you know, I'm, I'm mentioning Constantine is because he is the emperor who essentially created the religion of Christianity and infused it with the Roman Empire. And so as we broke down in the previous video, the whole essence of this was to 
essentially unite the Roman Empire in such a way that they all came under this belief system. They stole all of the stories, the mythology from, you know, the Egyptian story of Osiris and Osar and Oset. And they knew that to have um, a functioning civilization, that you needed a spiritual system in order to uphold that civilization. And so they took that same principle and they tried to apply it to the Roman Empire. At this time, you know, there, were, there was an Eastern faction, a Western faction. They were constantly warring amongst themselves because nobody could decide what they wanted to believe, etc., etc. But Constantine was the emperor that was essentially able to, you know, marry the Roman Empire together as one under this religious system. And it says here in the book, three important events marked Constantine's reign. He was the first Christian emperor of Rome. He made Christianity a lawful religion and he founded the city of Constantinople. Constantinople became the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and a symbol of Christian triumph. So one thing I wanted to make clear is that, you know, this idea that, you know, Christians were being murdered, you know, from the, from the biblical accounts all the way up until, you know, the time of Constantine, for their belief in Christ Jesus is absolute hogwash. The wars that did took place, did take place, and the crusades that take that took place, were not to kill what we would call Christians today, but was to kill the Coptic believers that knew that the Roman Empire were using this, you know, this idea of the Christ, because the Christ in itself is a real, you know, revelation that has been given by the Egyptians time immemorial but they were using this idea of the Christ and making it into a literal person with a literal historical account and they refused to go along with it they refused to you know accept it and you know in addition to that the Jews who we've already you know spoken about they did the same thing with even their faith and their religion they refused to go along with it too because as I said if the Jews had gone along well, the so-called Jews had gone along with what the Roman Empire were presenting, then it would have made them essentially all one group. But they wanted to be distinct from them. This had nothing to do with, you know, you know, them rejecting their Messiah or any of that nonsense. The Jews didn't want it because they didn't want to become a part of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire engaging in these crusades to essentially kill anybody who refused to go along with their religion. Kirk Franklin mentioned the Library of Alexandria being, you know, almost like the hub of, you know, education worldwide. Everybody from all different nations and all different places will come to Alexandria to study. If these people came with, you know, honorable intentions, why did they completely destroy it? Like he spoke about, you know, a lot of the, the spirituality in that day being an, um, an oratory system where, you know, things were, narrated um, and passed down through generations and not documented but the fact of the matter is that a lot of the spiritual systems were documented in this library and when the romans came and conquered um you know alexandria and egypt they took all the information and they took all of the papyrus that were within this library and then they completely destroyed it and burnt it down so he spoke about the fact that religion and christianity was founded upon ancient african gods and stories which were repurposed and centered on an original people who were black and brown and of African ancestry. The whole Bible story and events took place on the African continent because in that era, the Middle East did not exist. The whole region was known as Northeast Africa and the heritage was intentionally stolen and turned into who we consider today to be Jews or even more to the point, European Jews. So even the canal that separates, you know, the so-called Middle East from the Horn of Africa is a man-made canal. It was built in, in 1859 and it was completed in 1869 and so the Suez the Suez Canal is an artificial sea level waterway in Egypt connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea through the Isthmus of Suez dividing Africa and Asia and by extension the Sinai Peninsula for the from the rest of Egypt to kind of like continue this this lie and this fabrication of historical events and to you know further this ingrain this ingrenation of you know the belief that the middle east is a completely separate entity to the continent they built this canal so your mind when you look at it would completely separate that region from its original history so there's this book i'm going to go into this book now this book is called the who is this king of glory and it was written by Alvid, Alvin Boyd Kuhn. Again, it will be in the description. Um, and I just wanted to read 
a few quotes or a quote from this book. It starts off with, you know, a quote that was made by Pope Leo the Fifth, which reads, what profit hath not that fable of Christ brought us? And so, you know, as always, research into this. So it says the earliest known source of this statement is actually a polemical work by the Protestant John Bell, the anti-Catholic actor Romanum Pontificum, which was first translated from Latin into English as the pageant of the popes in 1574. For on a time when a cardinal Bembus did move a question out of the gospel, the Pope gave him a very contemptuous answer. All ages can testify enough how profitable that fable of Christ have been to us and our company. The Pope in this case being Leo V. Later accounts of it exist as recorded by Vatican librarian, Cardinal Baronius in the Annalis Ecclesiasticae, 1597, a 12 volume history of the church. So this quote is basically saying, in essence, that the superstition or the fable of Christ, profitable, you know, fable for the Christian church from their, for their predecessors. And they're basically trying to debunk it. But if you look at this statement, it talks about the account of it recorded by a Vatican librarian in a 12 volume history of the church. And so again, we always run into this, did this happen? Was this said, was this done? But again, we're going, we have to go back to the fact of what has been said, actually been perpetuate, perpetuated by the church. Has the gospel of Christ been beneficial to the European nations or the Roman empire? The answer is yes. So I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read two quotes from this book. It is a grave question whether the ecclesiastical system and movement known as Christianity has any right to its name. So far from being the cult that brought in a true Christ worship for the first time in heathen darkness, it was indeed after the third century, the one system that destroyed such a true worship. Ancient cults bent all effort upon the cultivation of the God within man. This is the nucleus of the only true Christianity. In its genuine sense, there has been no Christianity in the Occident since that fatal third century. Historical Christianity has substituted a personal fetish for the real Christos, the inner fire of love. No matter how appealing the figure substituted, it can never do the work of actual soul culture. And history has sealed this verdict. It is almost certainly true that in no quarter of human life has history so obviously and glaringly demonstrated the want of mankind's reliance upon the God instinct in the heart of the nations as has been evidenced by the horrifying spectacle of inhumanity and animal savagery put on display by the so-called Christianized nations. Christianity has never led the fight for culture. On the contrary, it has hung like a drag wheel on the car of real cultural and scientific advance for many centuries. Much incidental good, of course, has emerged from an effort to which millions of good people in more or less ignorance of historic truth have consecrated their last devotion, but never has it been the single aim and objective of the Christian ecclesiastical system to ground the aspirational life of its devotees upon the one pointed quickening of the, of the Christ within all hearts. So essentially, he's basically just talking about what we've already discussed that as much as Christianity tries to champion itself as bringing, you know, um, light to the world, bringing them into righteousness, all the Christian, all the Christianized nations have displayed the most horrific inhumane practices and af animal savagery that we've seen in the history of our known world. I'm going to read the second quote as well. And this chapter is called Faith Weds Folly. To the conscientious student who will give to the matter sufficient time and reflection, it becomes a conviction that the most devastating cultural calamity that has befallen the human race in all its history was a degradation of the esoteric spiritual purport of ancient scripture into a debased literal and historical sense entailing centuries of mental benightedness and spiritual thwarting that took place at about the third century of the Christian era. And in this catastrophic conversion of cosmography, evolutionary pictography and racial history over into alleged factual occurrence, the single feature most signally fruitful of age-long fatuity was the transformation of the dramatic figure of the Christos or divine essence of man's nature over into a historical person. Indeed, the truth of the situation warrants the statement that the injection of a living man into the spiritual drama in the place of personified divine ego in man has held the rational mind of the Western world in the grip of the most arrant superstition to be found in the history of civilized humanity. And so the reason I read that out is because it's important that as you start to get into this level of research and this level of scrutiny of, you know, the faith that we know as Christianity, you have to get to that place within yourself, as I said before, where you're able to critically assess the information 
the factual information, the documented record, the historical account, and come to a logical conclusion about what this actually is. As I start going into, you know, actual African sacred science part of it all, one thing I want you to see and really understand and grasp is that all the spiritual systems across the indigenous world, I'm talking about the indigenous systems, they're very similar because they have one source and they were all expressions of the same. Spirituality is an expression and a reverence of nature because the ancients were aware that everything was a reflection of the Most High himself. In different parts of the world, there are different expressions of nature. From the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere, they experience opposite seasons and in other parts of the world, some experience day while others experience night. Spirituality is not just, um, it's, not, it's not religious in a sense that, you know, this is my belief system and, you know, these are the laws. Spirituality in its indigenous form encompassed everything you could imagine. Everything that had life was a part of spirituality. It encompassed your ecology, your cosmology, it encouraged, um, encompassed nature, your relation to self, your relation to other people, your relation to animals, your relation to, you know, um, you know, wildlife and agriculture. It encompassed absolutely everything. And so if spirituality is an, is an expression of nature or you know what people are able to perceive with their five senses of nature then one person in one area of the world is going to have a completely different expression to someone else but that's the beauty of it even though their expressions are different the source is the same which is essentially the most high god himself i saw a post the other day that came up on my um that came up on my feed and i wanted to play it to you because I didn't want to narrate it because I really wanted you to get the essence of what she was trying to say. So I'm going to play it. I don't think that God really has a problem with different religions. I think that God might have a problem with us killing each other because we have different religions. Religions, when you boil them down, are just a collection of stories, ways of explaining the unexplainable to ourselves, a collection of symbols, ideas, mythos, songs, rituals, prayers. You look at god's creation i was looking up today roses everybody been talking about roses lately i always keep fresh roses did you know that there are 150 different kinds of wild roses with 30,000 variations that's just one flower now you need to ask yourself how many different flowers are there in the world how many flowers have there been in the history how many flowers remain yet undiscovered right so how many species of, of flowers have gone extinct and no longer grow in this world and then how many variations of those different flowers exist you have to understand that god is the author of variety diversity she loves he they it whatever loves variety a divine variety and i think that if they wanted us all to think the same look the same live the same love the same 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 they could have created us the same i don't think that is god who has the problem with our differences I don't think it ever was. I think that God can handle a little variety since he is the author of it. So what she so eloquently explained is that it's clear that in every expression of nature, there is variety. We spoke about in the previous video about how all the Abrahamic religions essentially stole the cosmology and literature from Kemet in today, which is called Egypt. And so in this part of the video, I wanted to kind of circle back to the original so I can give you a proper understanding or you know a knowledge of what African the essence of what African sacred science is and why Europeans using their culture using their fabricated religion have done everything in their power not only to destroy it but to keep you as far away from it as possible so I'm going to be referring to a few books and again I'll put them into the description and the first book that I'm going to be referring to is called um, Metineta volume 1 the Great Oracle of Tahuti and the Egyptian System of Spiritual Cultivation. And there's a specific reason why I wanted to use this book. I also wanted to just point out that if you were to try and buy this particular book online, I'm gonna put a link in the description for this book anyway, it will cost you over a thousand pounds to buy it in print. And that's the same for all of the other books that come after it, because I think it goes up to like seven. Um, I think I found two and three on Amazon, and they're all in a region of a thousand to two thousand pounds to buy the book in print. So it just goes to show really how valuable it is. Because if this was nonsense, <laughs> they wouldn't chad to keep it from you. If you do want this book, I've got it on PDF. And I can't remember where I actually got it from. So if you want the PDF of this book, by all means, send me a DM on Instagram or um, 
Send me a DM on Instagram or comment underneath the video, send me an email and I'll forward it to you. Okay, let's get into this. So there's a lot of there's a lot of points in this book that I wanted to kind of bring to the table, but it's so much information. So I'm gonna try my best to keep it, you know, short and sweet and then go on to the next point. The world is in the sorry mess that it now finds itself because the dominant culture in the world is that of the external part of being. It is not enough to say that the external part of our being does not know much about creating and maintaining order. For even if it did, it lacks the ability to generate order in the life of people. Hearing sermons and reading books, which are external means, on moral behaviour will make you as moral as reading books. On healing will heal your illnesses. The most that a book on health, for example, can do is to direct you to some means of directly influencing the automaton. Yet such information must have originated from some person's intuition. The same holds true for religious, moral and spiritual behaviour. All teachings on the subjects originated from the inner part of people's being. If you observe very carefully, you will see that in the religions of the dominant cultures today, people are directed outside of themselves, to scriptures, to sermons, um, to pastors, for moral and spiritual guidance. And in contrast, African and some oriental cultures direct their members within themselves trance for intuitive guidance for the same ends the differences are vast we must recall the fact that the external part of being however lucid on a subject lacks the power to direct the processes that shape our behavior and bodily functions now we can fully understand the lack of wisdom in denouncing westerners as hypocrites for preaching doctrines of such high moral values while their destructive acts in the world are unparalleled. So essentially what, what the person's trying to explain here, European culture is such that if you want to know how to do anything, you have to read it. It's like you have to you have to like basically find this information through essentially external means. Nothing that is kind of um, found or done comes to you comes to you intuitively. But Africans have never functioned this way. The reason why we are able to do things and, and understand things intuitively is because our spiritual sciences and our sacred sciences enable us to do that. And I'm going to go on and read another part. You know, you can read as many books as you want to on morality, but un unless it's intuitively inside of you, that book is not going to get you any closer to a moral nature. And that's evident because regardless of how much the Europeans stole from Egyptian culture, no matter how much they gleaned from it, repurposed it, read it, wrote it, how has that changed their culture? How has that changed them, you know, their, their psyche, their mentality, the way they do things? It hasn't in any way, shape or form. If anything, it's worsened it. But Africans intuitively rooted in their spirituality and their um, sacred sciences how to do things. But regardless of whether you have to read information from a book, there has to be a level of you going inside of yourself to know something intuitively so it becomes a part of you and who you are as a person rather than you just reading it and expecting somehow the book is going to change your morality or your, your nature. So another quote in the book um, reads, During the first 2000 years of history, so 4000 to 2000 BC, the only nations that attained to a high degree of civilization were Kemet, ancient Egypt, Sumer, Babylon, Canaan, Harappa Valley and Kush, which is Ethiopia. Although it is well known to all serious histor historians that all these nations were black, to this day, much effort has been made to hide the fact from the general population, with some of it due to racism. With others, it is due to feelings of shame over the fact that throughout the first 4,000 years of history, 6,000 to 1 BC, it is well known that Western people had attained to very little cultural development, as well as the fact that they are indebted to the above black nations for the foundation of their scientific, religious and philosophical accomplishments. They repaid these nations by utterly destroying their civilizations and enslaving their descendants. And with others, it is because they took the traditions of these black nations, added a few touches here and there to make it more in keeping with some of their social values, and then claimed that the final product was a revelation from God to them. That doesn't really need explaining. So the previous um, video, we mentioned that all the Abrahamic faiths, in some way, shape or form, that the feminine principle has been removed. And therefore, we have a patriarchal society where men dominate the culture. 
And earlier on in the book, um, I didn't want to read that as well because it's, it's quite long. But earlier on in the book, he explains that the pattern of thought and thinking between the right and left hemisphere of your brain is what dictates how close you are to your kind of like your intuition and your intuitive thinking. That's the right side of your brain. And scientifically speaking, men use mostly the left side of their brain and Europeans as a whole also use mostly the left side of their brain which is the the side of your brain that you know separates things from others it's um it's kind of like a lone ranger mentality and it's very mechanical in the way that it thinks this is not bad but your left and your right side of your brain are supposed to work synergistically in order for you to reach you know a healthy conclusion of things anything that you come in contact with whether it's smell whether it's touch whether it's relationship, relations to other people, etc., etc., you need both sides or both hemispheres of your brain to function in a certain way. But in terms of like the unk, what we spoke about last week, where you have the feminine principle and the masculine principle, is that coming together of male and female that unites both the left thinking and the right thinking. And so with that in mind, I'm going to read one more quote. Um, from this particular book book and then I'm going to move on to something else participation in a series of African and oriental rituals will reveal to all that women in general can attain to the trance state with greater ease and power than men societies that have a deep appreciation for synthetical thinking and introversion due to their right-sidedness or equilib equilibration cannot fail then to hold in great esteem their women just the opposite is found in left-sided societies it is no wonder then to find that in all black nations which have not been led astray by whites, women and goddesses occupy positions and play roles equaling those of the males. Women in Kemet and other black nations of antiquity occupied positions not yet achieved by Western women to date. As queen mothers, they determined the transference of the kingship and legitimized the king. Inheritance was through them. That is, they held the wealth of the nation. They were priestesses in their own right, and it is a matter of record that the goddesses whose shrines they were responsible for commanded greater importance than those of the gods in many cases. In contrast, we find Western women just beginning to make headway in their struggle for equality 6,000 years behind their black counterparts. We, we've been kind of like conditioned with um, Western religions especially Christianity, that somehow, you know, Europeans needed to come over to, you know, black and indigenous nations to civilize us and to give us something that we never had. We've already covered, like I said, in previous videos and including this video, there is nothing that Europeans came to give us that we didn't already have. And there's nothing that they have that wasn't taken from us in the first place. And I'm going to refer to another book. Um, I've got a lot of books today, <laughs> to be honest. Um, this one is called um, Ghana in retrospect because I am Ghanaian and um, in all of the research I've been doing, um, I've basically researched a lot of my own particular culture. This particular part that I'm going to read is about ancestors and the reason why, you know, I wanted to even touch on this is because in the in the video that Stephanie did on African spirituality, she mentions serving the God of your ancestors and this idea of venerating ancestors. So I'm just going to read a snippet here and kind of go into it a bit deeper. But it says, Belief in the spirits of the dead and in their influence over the living is found among all peoples and in every conceivable religion and culture. Christians believe in saints who are only good Christians who are dead and are believed to be in heaven enjoying eternal bliss with their creator and father. Muslim worshippers believe in Muhammad, Isafal and a host of others whose names they impose on themselves. Belief in ancestors and their veneration, therefore, are not peculiar to any age, religion or society. The two are as old as the world. It is only in the words that are used to describe the dead that differ. When Christians call their dead saints and refer to those of so-called pagans as ancestors, they are not expressing different ideas. Both words express ideas about people who once belonged to their religious group and are now dead and are supposed to be in a position of influence over the living. And so this kind of goes back to what I was saying in the previous video about, you know, there's so many things that are sitting inside the Old Testament of the Bible specifically, and sometimes even the New Testament, that speak directly to something that anyone can recognize as being an African spiritual um, practice or ritual. But when it's in the Bible, nobody sees an issue with it whatsoever. But as soon as it shows up in African spirituality, all of a sudden it becomes demonic. And this is what I was talking to you about language and how, you know, they've used language to demonize something, to de demonize certain things. They're referred to as pagans or uncivilized or savages. 
and it's the language that you know Europeans have used over the ages that has you know conditioned our minds to see something that may be exactly the same thing in both cultures but we view it in different ways yeah I'm gonna go into it like in more detail and depth in the following video but what I also want you to understand is that all of the you know the Asian um, spirituality systems in Africa as much as they are different they're very much the same meaning that they have the same source is what I'm trying to say we already know what the source is but one thing that is very prevalent in our culture is that it's been demonized to the point where people literally look at African spirituality as evil and now I'm not saying for one second that there aren't things that go on within African spirituality that cannot be deemed as evil or cannot be deemed as you know as wrong but what I want you to, to really get a hold of is the essence of all of these cultures in their original form so for example like i said we'll go into this deeper in another video but just to give you an example the term voodoo um is what people kind of like when you say the word voodoo people automatically think of like witchcraft in the sense of like black and evil like dark magic and evil magic even the even the terms that i'm using is not really appropriate because again it's everything that is bad is linked to darkness and blackness and that is also language that has been purported to us as a people but voodoo when you think of voodoo you think of the worst imaginable you think of you know what we've been exposed to in terms of films and hollywood and nollywood and all of these dramas but the original term is vodun and it's spelled v-o-d-o-u-n i'm just going to read you the definition of vodun because the original word is not voodoo it's vodun the word vodou v-o-u-d-o-u -O -O means life principle genius and spirit in the Fon and Awe languages of West Africa. All in all, African sacred science encompasses a respect for human life, nature, ecology and cosmology, which is the basis of any civilization. Europe has never produced or respected this. Rather, their whole entire history is drenched in war, death, stealing and destruction, with the aim of completely subjugating other people. Their primary concern has always been to destroy black and indigenous peoples and they're happy to kill their own as long as it serves the main purpose and goal. Again, when we go back to this idea of African spirituality or African, you know, spiritual practices being wicked, I wanted to ask a few questions. Like we said, we're gonna go into this deeply in the next video. I just want you to ponder on this. When we think of the worst things that people may have experienced when it comes to African spirituality, we've all heard of juju, we've all heard of jazz, we've all heard of these different things. Like I said, I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't evil things that happen within African spirituality. When we think of the practice as a whole, is can we say that it's a work of individuals or whole systems? Or can we say it's individuals or whole nations? And the reason I'm asking this is because when we think of African spirituality, the moment people hear it, it's like it gets demonized immediately. History as we know it. How many genocides has African sacred sciences or African spirituality committed? How many nations has African spirituality wiped out or conquered? Bearing in mind that all, all that we've gone through as a people you know, as black and indigenous people on in the world as a whole. When have we used African spirituality or African sacred sciences to wipe out or conquer whole nations? You've never heard of it, have you? So when we talk about, you know, all the atrocities that Christians have committed, and, you know, in, in Stephanie's video, she emphasizes this point about, you know, a few, only a few individuals, you know, have used Christianity, you know, to do wicked things, but we've broken down in over two videos that the whole institution of Christianity was was brutal, murderous and destructive from its very inception because it was created in order to subjugate peoples. So how can we sit here or how can anybody, pastor, preacher, especially black, black and indigenous pastors, preachers, teachers, sit here and champion Christianity over their own cultural beliefs. And Christianity on its own has created more destruction and more death than this world has ever seen than African spirituality ever had. And can you see the cognitive dissonance? No. Can you see the hypocrisy just shining through? Because it doesn't compare. The second question I wanted to ask is if African spirituality or African sacred sciences are so evil and so wicked, so despicable, so savage, why did the Europeans steal everything from it and use it as its foundation in their religions and then take all of the trophies or all of the monuments the prized possessions of our people our cultures and place them in their museums today to this day you can go to the british history museum and you can find you know the Egypt, the ancient egyptian mummy sitting in there they're not afraid of that apparently that's not it's not demonic enough that they would keep it on display or they've got you know the benin bronzes sitting in the british history museum it's so demonic but they they would have them on display 
You can go to France, you can go to the Louvre and you'll find, you know, things that they've done and taken into, into their museums, but that's not demonic either. There's also a um, specific museum, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but I'm gonna post a picture here in France. When you go into this cave, literally the whole entire structure inside are the bones and skulls. Of, and again, this is a Christian nation. But that's not demonic. It's not demonic of them to keep the skulls and the bodies of these people that they killed in their museum. But again, it's African spirituality or African sacred sciences that are demonized. Now there's this other book that I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to. And I'm getting ready to close out the video now. Um, this book is called The Miseducation of the Negro. I'll put the link in the description, as always. And there's just a few passages that I wanted to read from here. So bear with me, bear with me. We're nearly there. And this this chapter is called The Seat of Trouble. It says the educated Negroes have the attitude and contempt toward their own people because in their own as well as in their mixed schools Negroes are taught to admire the Hebrew, Greek, the Latin and the Teuton and to despise the African. Of the hundreds of Negro high schools recently examined by an expert in the United States Bureau of Education only 18 offer a course taking up the history of the Negro and in most of the Negro colleges and universities where the Negro is thought of the race is studied only as a problem or dismissed of dismissed as of little consequence and we kind of already covered that in the in the previous video about you know this idea again of you know hebrew and where hebrew actually originates from and the fact that that's a fabricated language but yet because it's a european language it's been held in such you know high esteem with latin and greek and all of these other european languages not realizing that actually a lot of what they have was gleaned from us in the first place and there's actually a link that i put in a previous videos but i'm not sure if i mentioned it but there's a there's a there's a pdf that you can click below which shows how closely the hebrew language is to the kikongo language which is another ancient language that is still spoken in the country of congo today so just going on onto this one it says in the study of language in schools pupil pupils were made to scoff at the Negro dialect at some peculiar possession of the Negro, which they should despise and rather than study, rather than directed to study the background of this language as a broken down African tongue. In short, to understand their own linguistic history, which is certainly more important for them than the study of French phonetics or historical Spanish grammar. To the African language, as, as such, no attention was given except in case of the preparation of traders, missionaries and public functionaries to exploit the natives. This number of persons thus trained, of course, constituted a small fraction hardly deserving attention. And this is still really prevalent today, that even if you go to like, um, you know, schools across the African continent, majority of these schools don't teach native languages, they don't teach their native, you know, stories or their native histories. They're literally teaching Western education, they're teaching, you know, children in these African countries how to speak French and how to speak Spanish and how to speak all of these languages that don't have any relevance to them. And I'm not necessarily saying, you know, it's an issue to study other languages because it's good to be multilingual. But the reality is that the fact that most of these countries can already speak, you know, either French because they were colonized by the French or they can already speak English because they were colonized by the English. They already have their mother tongues, but it's like they're discouraged from actually speaking it. And I remember um, watching a or reading an article where in, there are some schools that even in South Africa today where you are not allowed to speak your native tongue in those schools. And if you do, you'll literally be punished for it. And so again, what do you think this does to the psyche of the child? Because they know that they're African, they're raised in Africa, but it's like everywhere they go, in school, you know, outside school, on TV, on media, their culture's consistently demonized, consistently, you know, um, degraded underneath that of the European, not knowing that everything that they have in their culture is what Europeans stole from them. Anyway, let's continue. So from literature, the African was excluded altogether. He was not supposed to have expressed any thought worth knowing. The philosophy in the African proverbs and in the rich folklore of that continent was ignored to give preference to that developed on the distant shores of the Mediterranean. Most missionary teachers or the freedmen, like men of our time, had never read the interesting books of travel in Africa and had never heard the Tariq es Sudan. In the teaching of fine arts, these instructions usually started with Greece by showing how that art was influenced from without, but they omitted the African influence which scientists now regard as significant and dominant in early Hellas. They failed to teach the student the Mediterranean melting pot with the Negroes from Africa, bringing their wares, their ideas and their blood therein to influence the history of Greece, Carthage and Rome making desire farther to the thought. 
Our teachers either ignore these influences or endeavor to belittle them by working out theories to the contrary. Now, just before I get towards the end of the video, I'm just gonna play like one, I'm just gonna play one more section of Stephanie's video before I make my last point and close out. Now, Simon was from Cyrene. Cyrene is a city in North Africa. Simon was an African. An African played a pivotal role in assisting Jesus to carry his burden as he was approaching the finish line. This was the, the, the it could have been that, and they seized a certain man. If the Lord wanted this to be random, he would just allow it to be. And there was a certain young man who was seized to help Jesus carry his cross. No, there was an African man who was seized to carry the burden as Jesus was rich in the finish line of his assignment on earth. And what I want to share, I need you to hear my heart because there is so much prophetic revelation in this moment because what Simon did implicated his nation. What Simon did in that moment implicated Africa as a whole. That in the same way that he carried this burden to the finish line of his earthly ministry, you know, or, you know, close to the finish line, rather, there's, there's so much because he actually carried it out of the city, but there's so much in that. But as Simon played a pivotal role in carrying the cross, in helping Jesus carry his cross, there is an assignment, an agenda that the Lord has in his end times plan that Africans play a pivotal role. So she's talking about, you know, this idea that the reason why Simon of um, Cyrene, his, his, his nationality was identified because, you know, the spirit of God wanted people to know that an African man had, you know, a, a, a pivotal role in the carrying of the cross. And she goes on to talk about, you know, it's symbolic of the fact that Africans have a pivotal role in, you know, furthering the gospel in the end time. Now, based on everything that we've covered from the last video, this video, do you not see how what she said can be very foolish? <laughs> I think foolish is the right word because we've already covered the fact that the whole entire Bible takes place on the African continent. We already dissected the fact that the Middle East at that time was not the Middle East, it was considered the Northeast of Africa. So the whole entire Bible, or all of the Bible's stories, would have taken place on the African continent. And that means that all the characters within the Bible would have been African and indigenous people. So the fact that she's pointing out that this African man carried the cross is obsolete because the whole Bible essentially is African. And we're talking about the fact that, you know, they based all of their stories and took all of their stories from the Egyptians anyway. What is communicated to me as I listen to her say this, and this is what I get, you know, when I listen to any, you know, black or indigenous pastors or preachers speak, even while they're trying to almost venerate themselves as Africans, they're speaking about themselves from a lower point of view or a westernized or European worldview. Because like I said, if the whole book is centered in Africa, and all of the characters are essentially African people, then what is the poignancy or what is what what is what is the stark contrast of Simon of the Cyrene being an African? But it's the mindset that because the book that they don't want you to believe is a white man's religion, the end time somehow is connected to us, even though the whole book is based on us in the first place. So there's another, this is the last book that I'm gonna quote from. This book is called African Philosophical Thought. And I'm just gonna um, read this quote quickly, just to reiterate the point that I just made. So I maintain that a history of philosophical thought in Africa will have to include the philosophical productions of past African traditional thinkers or sages. A good deal of evidence is emerging based on ancient sources such as Herodotus, Aristotle, Diodorus and Strabo to indicate that the civilization, of, the civilization of ancient Egypt was African. Four renowned historians of Africa affirm that Egypt, the first African civilization, in addition, was the first African civilization. In addition, the late erudite Senegalese scholar Cheek Antidiop 
demonstrated with conviction that ancient Egyptians were African people and thus their civilization was African. If the ancient Egyptian civilization was indeed African, then ancient Egyptian philosophical, philosophical thought, a well-documented intellectual component of that civilization, can be said to be African. Did you know that, you know, even in Greek mythology, the pantheon gods that, you know, they, they took and they repurposed, in their own mythology, they document the fact that their gods, their Greek gods, have to go back to the African continent to re-energize their power before they come back to their temples. There's always a central, you know, theme that goes back to Africa because this is where all of the spirituality essentially originates from. And so this idea that, you know, Christians are going to play a part in end times, the only reason why you would, people would have that thought is because in essence, if you think of the most, you know, religious people, you know, worldwide, Africans are always the first people to come to mind. And the reason that is, is because we, you know, when we talk about, you know, power being in the name of Jesus, about, you know, I've seen miracles take place, I've seen miracles happen in the name of Jesus, you know, in, in Jesus' name and things happen and things move, doesn't that mean that Jesus is real? No, because even the Bible shows this. If you go to Matthew 13, verse 57, 58, I'm not going to read this out for time, Mark 10, verse 52, Mark 5, verse 34 and also mark 9 verse 23 and 24 these are four instances four stories in the new testament where you know people came to jesus with the desire to be healed or to see their dead raised to life and he literally tells them i cannot do anything unless you have faith you can only be healed if you have faith and it also says you know in one of the scriptures that you know he was performing all of these miracles when he went to his hometown because they doubted who he was he wasn't able to do many miracles there because they didn't believe him so already those scriptures are indicating to you the truth that the only power that exists in the name of Jesus is the power that we give to it and when I say we I'm talking about black and indigenous people because as much as they want to shy away from the fact of who we are and you know they've changed hidden and stolen our identity and our culture and all of these things they will always know who we are the problem is that we don't and Christianity will always see to dumb you know Africans down to oh you know this whole story is not really about you but you play a little role is that what you want to be with used to because like I said the power in the name of Jesus is not in the name itself the power in the name of Jesus is the power that we as black and indigenous people have given to it as the original spiritual people of the earth have given to it and when I get into the video um, a bit later on about melanin and break down what melanin actually is you'll come to realize why they have done everything in their power to strip you of your identity tell you who you are and take your spiritual systems and your sacred sciences away from you. So much emphasis has been placed on good and evil and you know, without even thinking about it, white is always deemed or seen as good and black is always seen as evil. And this can be conscious or subconsciously. I'm sure most people have seen this online where they get, you know, all of these kids into a room and they put these two dolls in front of them. There's a white doll and a black doll and they ask the kids, you know, where, where's the pretty doll? And all of the kids, whether black or white, point to the white doll. And they say, where's the ugly doll? And all of the kids, black and white, point to the black doll. And this is what you need to understand. The, the reason why I broke down, you know, the, the, the definition of racism and went into all that detail about, you know, what things have been done in order to break down and destroy the mental and the psyche of the black community is because they know that they need to strip you of your own self-worth and your own divinity in order to give you something that, sub that makes you subservient to them we talk about you know like i said this idea this hypocrisy where anything that exists in the bible is deemed as righteous whether it's saints whether it's divination whether it's um, pouring of libation whether it, it doesn't matter what it is as long as it's in the bible and it's, it's been done you know by european um culture or civilization is deemed as good but when it's seen exactly the same things are seen in african culture it's been demonized that's a mindset that's an indoctrination that's not the truth and yes like I said before, there is wickedness, there is wicked practices that go on in African spirituality, but they are nowhere near to causing the damage, the indoctrination and the, you know, the pillaging and rape and destruction that all the Abrahamic religions have caused on this planet today. So to try and even compare them or to demonize one over the other when it everything is glaring at you in the face is really a folly the other thing that i you know adopting christianity or abrahamic faiths do is immobilize you like we we're talking about before in the book that i read earlier is this constant everything that you need is outside of you this external oh i need to ask my pastor or i need to speak to my pastor it's like you don't have it's like you're immobilized from really digging deep and really understanding 
yourself, knowing who you are and being able to tap into that intuitiveness of your character. And this is another thing that I wanted to, I wanted to touch on, I wanted to read in some of these books, but I'll leave it till next week. But just, gen just generally speaking, in all of the cultures and all of the African sacred sciences that I've researched, you know, this idea of evil and wickedness, in Western culture, it's everything is blamed on the devil, this character, this, you know, personification of evil, this devil person, everything is always blamed on the devil. When in African cultures, the devil doesn't exist. Everything that is done, which is wicked or evil, is essentially a man's character. It comes down to, you know, who you decide to be. And I'll give an example. You know, we talk about knife crime, especially in the UK. You can have a knife. There are knives in every single home across the country but we don't have an, an epidemic of people you know running around committing murders every day day in day out people using knives just to kill people most people a majority of the population use their knives in their kitchen to cook if a small minority of people decide to use those same knives to go out on the street and murder people is the issue with the knife or is the issue of the person holding it that's quite straightforward isn't it so what I want to propose to you is that in the midst of our cultures and our African sacred sciences, there is power. And this is why no matter what you believe, and even in Stephanie's testimony, she talks about an incident that happens within that video where she was able to see the power of African spirituality manifested. And many people can attest to this, no matter where you're from. Everybody knows that African spirituality is real. All it comes down to is who is that power in the hands of? You can use that power to do good or you can use that power to do evil and wickedness. The reason why Europeans did everything in their power to demonize the whole entire sacred science from beginning to end, top to bottom, left to right, is because they wanted to take it away from you. So before I close this video, I wanna, you know, just quote, you know, this scripture from Isaiah 5 verse 20. So it talks about a people who will call evil good and call good evil. And I wanna leave you with a few questions. Is the devil a real being, a real entity, based on everything that we've covered from the previous video to this video, with regards to the, you know, the stories, the Bible being fabricated, the people being fabricated, you know, everything being a fabrication of lies. Is the devil a real being or is the devil a culture? Because Christ, like I said, there is a Christ and the Christ was referenced and well documented in all the ancient you know cosmologies that came from ancient Kemet but Christ was personified as the savior of mankind by Europeans is it possible that the same way the Christ was personified is the same way evil has been personified by European nations not so much to scare me and you but to allow their traits their psyche their actions and their behaviors to be placed on someone else in order that, that they don't get any blame. Because everything that Western man has done and is still doing till this very day has been personified, especially where the Bible talks about the devil in the one who comes to steal, kill and destroy. When we talk about stealing, killing and destroying, there's only one culture on the face of this planet that has personified those three words. One culture. I'm gonna leave you with this last quote. No Abrahamic religion gives a true depiction of our story. In fact, they're all well-scripted, heavily usurped lies. Your theology dictates your psychology. So how you perceive divinity is how you see reality. Therefore, you must have a cultural concept of God. The Western concept of God is totalitarian, misogynistic, jealous and warmongering, just like the behavior of its government. Culture expresses your relationship with divinity and is based on your ecology, your biology, region and ancestry. It's how you articulate the presence of God and its creations. That's why venerating your ancestors and the elements in nature is the highest praise you can give to God. Worshipping the God of your ancestors' enemies is a complete conquest of your consciousness and it disables the gifts in your DNA. The Christian redemption fable is based on blood sacrifice. Accepting Jesus as your saviour gives the Caucasoid vicarious atonement by permitting the forgiveness of their murderous crimes and their debt to you, allowing their sins to be washed away in the blood of your ancestors. Let that sink in and I'll see you in next week's video.